Hi there, um, good to be with you again. Thank you if you're able to join us. Um, this study in Hebrews that I'm doing, um, now up to chapter 3 in Hebrews, which is what we're going to walk through together today. And hopefully we're going to get some real nuggets of nuggets of encouragement in this passage. And we're going to see which verses in Hebrews 3 are really aimed at us as believers and also those that have not yet come to a faith in Christ. So just for a little quick recap, um, if you've been with us for the first couple of sessions, Hebrews 1 and 2, those two chapters, the writer to Hebrews was making it clear to the Jews, the Hebrews, this is who the letter was to, that Jesus is greater than the angels. What, why, why is that? Well, just a quick recap. I've already covered this before in previous sessions. But the angels were the ones in the Bible that we were told that delivered the law to Moses. So in chapter one, the writer of Hebrews, who they believe was Paul, um, was wanting to make his Hebrew audience, the Jews, aware that he was saying Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than the old covenant because he's brought in a new covenant, a better covenant, Hebrews calls it. So that was Hebrews 1. Hebrews 2, again, that we looked at last time, was very much talking again about the fact that Jesus was greater than the angels and we looked at, at some of the wonderful truths of the new covenant, but also um, how unbelievers were um, struggling um, with really coming through to believe in Jesus as Messiah. And the writer was speaking into that. So we're now up to today. We're now going to start in Hebrews chapter three. Um, and if you have a Bible with me, whether it's on your phone or in your lap, or you may not have one, that's fine. But um, I'm going to be speaking from the New American Standard Bible today. So that's how we're going to sort of walk through it today. OK, so the Hebrew writer to the Hebrews, what he's wanting to get over to his own people, to the to the Jewish community, is that Jesus has come. He is their promised Messiah. He has brought in a new covenant that has superseded the old covenant. As Hebrews says, the old covenant, the law of Moses is now obsolete. And in another place, it says it's useless because the new covenant has now come in. And as Gentile believers, particularly for us, there is only one covenant. There is the new covenant. So this is the context that we're reading through Hebrews chapter three today. And the writer continues to press the point that Jesus is a high priest, that Jesus is greater than Moses. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. That's what we're going to hear and be hearing about. And, and putting it again in a little bit more context, you see, when you read through the book of Hebrews, you'll see that the only sin that's mentioned through the whole of the book of Hebrews is the sin of unbelief. Now, that might be quite a surprise to you, and it was to me when I studied it, but it is the case. Look at it and study it yourself. You'll see this, that the writer is always speaking about the sin of unbelief because within the Jewish community under the Old Covenant, they took a lot of pride about their external behaviour, the fact that they were trying to keep the law and live morally, etc. So the writer in Hebrews is wanting them to see that actually the issue they had was not so much with their external behaviour, although they would no, by no means have been perfect and couldn't keep the law perfectly, but their issue was about their heart. And this was an inward um, problem that the Jewish community had. It wasn't like um, the Gentile community that, that, that the Jews looked at um, and saw as highly immoral um, because of their immoral behaviour. You only have to read about this in the books uh, Paul writes to Corinthians, how the church was struggling with its immorality. The Jews prided themselves in that they, they, they weren't like that because they were trying to follow the law and keep it. So the book of Hebrews is very much honing in on the fact that although they were trying to do this, they were still a number of them rejecting Jesus as Messiah. And so they had this unbelief that the, the writer is addressing to them and saying to them, look, you need to come and, and believe and receive that Jesus is your Messiah. He's come for you. So this whole book, the context is that he's writing to Hebrews, to Jews. Many of them were rejecting Jesus as Messiah and still going to the temple to offer sacrifices at this point. In Jerusalem. Some were um, toe dipping, if you like, into what they'd heard from the apostles in Jerusalem and the, and the Christians in, in the church here, in the house churches, home churches. 
some of those Jews were hearing the gospel and toe dipping into it. So they were joining in with the congregation, joining in with these people meeting in homes, listening to the gospel. But they were still going back to the temple. They were still mixing law with grace. And Paul's very clear in the book of Galatians, particularly that you can't do that. You have to choose Jesus. It's Jesus or nothing. Jesus is everything. So there's a little bit of context. So let's dive in then. Let's start with Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. And it begins like this. The writer says, Therefore, holy brethren. So he's talking here to believers. Brethren there is, a, um, if you look at it in the Greek word, um, it, it can mean literally brothers, um, as in family, but it can mean brothers as in your own community, your own heritage, your own people. So um, it's often used in the New Testament and it can be used in different ways. It can, it can be, like I say, be used for family members, but also the wider community that you come from, in this case, the Jewish community. So he's saying, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. And what's wonderful um, for us as New Covenant believers is when we have believed and received Jesus as our saviour, and we re realise that he died for our sins, that we died with him on the cross and he buried our sins. And then we rose with him to new life, that we too become part of that holy brethren, part of the family of God. We become part of the chosen people of God under the new covenant. So this is why he starts off by saying, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. You see, Jesus is God's ultimate and perfect messenger. He is the final word. And that's why chapters one and two, it says Jesus is greater than the message brought by the angels, which was the old covenant law. And we know that uh, uh, here the word high priest, literally in the Greek language, means chief. It means leader among priests. And of course, later in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus began a whole new priesthood and this is beautiful because Jesus didn't come from the line of Aaron the priest has laid out under the old covenant law with Moses you see Jesus was bringing a new covenant led by a greater high priest and we become part of that we are his royal priesthood isn't that incredible you and I are part of the royal priesthood of Jesus under this wonderful new covenant and it says in verse two, he was faithful, speaking of Jesus to him who appointed him as Moses also was in all his house. Then in verse three, it says this, for he has been counted worthy of, listen, more glory than Moses. There we go again. The writer's wanting his Hebrew hearers to hear this, that Jesus is greater than Moses, worthy of more glory than Moses, we read, by just so much as the builder of the house has more honour than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. And then in verse 5 it says, Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things that were to be spoken later. So it's saying here that yes, of course God used Moses to speak to the people through. And it was through um, delivering the, the law through angels to Moses, that God gave the Jewish people um, the old covenant. But here it's telling us that Jesus is greater. And Jesus is the builder of all things. Je Moses was a servant, but Jesus is the king. And everything that, that Moses was asked to do by God was like a picture. It was like a foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to do and fulfill. Even the tabernacle, which we don't have time to go into today. But the tabernacle speaks very much of what Christ was going to come, come and accomplish himself by entering the real tabernacle in heaven and bringing us into a relationship with God as our great high priest once for all through his blood being shed. And we know that Jesus is the builder. He is the one who built the house. In the Gospel of John, it tells us these words about Jesus. It says he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. Speaking of Jesus it says in him was life and the life was the light of men. 
The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. So Jesus is the builder. He designed and built everything. Jesus built the house, the dwelling place. And we now are that dwelling place. We are God's house. We are God's temple, God's tabernacle. And this again is a beautiful truth that Jesus comes and lives inside you and me right now as a believer by the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You are the temple of God, the Holy Scriptures tell us. And Jesus dwells there as a, as a new creation, the new creation that he's made us. He dwells there because he's made us perfect dwelling place for him by making us holy, cleansed and blameless, righteous in his sight. A beautiful work of salvation by our Jesus. So let's move on. And then verse 6 it says this, But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. We've just talked about that. And then it says these words, which sometimes when Christians read this text it worries them. It, it says this, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Let me just read that again. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house. So he was faithful to do everything that the God the Father had called him to do to bring us to salvation. Whose house we are if we're believers. But then it says, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. I just want to explain to you and make it clear to you that this is not a verse to fear. Where it's talking here about if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. This is not talking about believers. This is speaking to unbelievers. You see, in Bible times, you will see as you read the um, letters to the churches written by the apostles, they talk a lot about people needing to hear and believe. The word of God tells us, doesn't it, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, which is Jesus. You see, it was a process that people went through when they began to hear the gospel. They didn't necessarily come to Christ straight away. And I think part of the, the, the thing is in our understanding, we tend to sort of think of the, um, I don't know, the, the, the prayer of salvation where people come forward to say a prayer and receive Jesus at that point. A bit like the Billy Graham Crusades. But, in, but in, in most cases, people don't come to Jesus instantly like that. It takes the time. They hear bits of the gospel here, hear bits of the gospel there, go to different things, having different conversations with people. And gradually, by hearing and believing, they come to a place of faith where they realise Jesus has died for them and risen for them and, and, and shed his blood for their sins. So this is what this is talking about. There were people in these home churches in Jerusalem um, there were Christians in there, sure. And there were people that were, as I've spoken before in other sessions, not yet Christians. There were those that were there asking questions. Um, and there were baby Christians. There were people learning. But there was, there was in this group people that had not yet come to faith but were on the way to believing. And this is who it's talking about here. If we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. How can I say that? Well, in the following verses, it tells us, it puts it in context. Therefore, the very next verse says, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. There you go. That's telling us that this verse is aimed at unbelievers because new covenant believers don't have hardened hearts. We don't have unbelieving hearts. God told us he was going to take out our wicked hearts, take out our heart of stone and give us a new heart, a heart that wants to say yes, a heart that is obedient to Jesus. Romans 6, Paul talks about our new covenant heart being obedient to Jesus and wanting to live for him. So there we have it. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, the Holy Spirit is speaking into this under the new covenant because the Holy Spirit when we come to Jesus, he comes and he, he starts to speak to us about the truth of Jesus. And so he's saying, today, if you hear his voice, in other words, you hear the gospel, you hear the gospel of grace, you hear the truth. Don't harden your hearts. And then it puts context into what God's talking about. Who is he talking about here about hardened hearts? He then tells us 
as when they provoked me. And he's talking about when God called his people out of Egypt into the wilderness. Let's read on. As in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So these are the people this verse is speaking about here, about needing to hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope until the end. So if you people that are hearing, hearing the message of Jesus need to come to a place of faith and belief in him, not harden their heart, but receive this gift of salvation freely, this gift of grace. And to enter into the rest of Jesus, Jesus becomes our Sabbath rest, which is the next chapter we'll see next time. And Jesus is speaking here and God's telling us here for us to enter his rest. We need to believe in Jesus, not have a heart that a heart that is hardened to what he's saying to us, but receive his salvation, receive our new heart and enter his rest. But here he's talking about people that are refusing to do that. This is what is called unbelief. And it says here, doesn't it? They always go astray in their heart. They do not know my ways. They are. They didn't know Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. If you know Jesus, you know the way. And, and God says here, so as I swore, I shall not enter my rest. OK. And then verse 12, um, it says this. It says. Take care, brethren. There you go again. So it's speaking um, into the community of people. Take care, brethren. That you that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart, there you go, that falls away from the living God. Now, does that sound to you like a Christian? No. If you're a believer, you don't have an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from God. That does not describe a Christian. You have a new heart, you have a new covenant heart. You have a heart that God has given you that wants to say yes to Jesus, an obedient heart. And you don't fall away from God because you, Jesus said, no one can snatch you out of my hand. No one. You're safe with me. And Jesus says, once you've believed in me, you've passed. Um, you will not be judged. You've passed from death into life. So this is not describing a Christian. When Christians are not described as evil, we're holy people. We've already read that earlier on in this text. So this is speaking to those again in the in the gatherings that were coming into the church, like just like we have today, people that come in and inquire, come into church services regularly, but have not yet come to faith in Christ. So it's saying here, look, take care, hear the new covenant. Don't keep going back to the temple. Don't think you can mix Moses with Jesus. Jesus is greater. There's a new covenant that's come. And that's why it's giving this warning here, the writer, he's saying, do not, therefore, take care, brethren, that, that not, um, sorry, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. It's saying, look at yourself. Are you still in unbelief or have you come to a faith and belief in Jesus Christ? Are you, do you know Jesus as your saviour and your friend living in you by the spirit of God? But then it says, verse 13, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you, there it will go. See, it's wanting people to come to Jesus and see that it's Jesus is their saviour, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. There you go. Unbelief. The deceitfulness of sin that says, I don't need you, Jesus. I don't need you. I'm going to carry on following Moses, which is what a lot of the Jewish community were doing at this time. And even those that were coming to Christ, they were trying to encourage them back. There was persecution going on in the in the Christian church amongst those that had come to faith in Christ. And the Judaizers were persecuting them, trying to get them to come back to the temple um, and to, to deny Jesus because they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. And they wanted them in the temple at sacrificing animals and still coming under the Mosaic law. Then it says, verse 14, for we have become partakers of of Christ again there we go if we hold fast the beginning the beginning of our assurance firm until the end again is saying to us keep 
responding, keep believing, keep hearing and make a decision to follow Jesus. And then you're saved. Nothing can take you out of Jesus' hand. Nothing can snatch you from his hand. There is no fear in love. You see that as a believer, you're safe. <laughs> There's no perfect love casts out fear. If these work verses were aimed at Christians, you would feel fear. <laughs> They're not. This is speaking to the fact that it's a mixed gathering of people coming together. Some know Jesus, some are baby Christians, some haven't got there yet. OK, so moving on. Again, it says, today, if you hear your voice, there we go again, that encouragement. Do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. And then we finish up in the last couple of verses, verse, well, verses 16 through to 19. For, God's, for, for God is saying here, for who provoked him when they, when they heard? In other words, God. Who provoked God when they heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? That's a picture of salvation but to those who were disobedient. What was their disobedience? Unbelief. Think about what happened when God led his people out of Egypt, out of slavery, into the wilderness. The first thing God did, which was so loving and a beautiful picture of grace, was he didn't take them the short route through the wilderness because he knew they were going to have to fight and he, th he knew they'd be fearful and would run back to probably to Egypt. So he took them the long way through the wilderness to look after them. And they still moaned even though God produced miracle after miracle for them, fed them, led them through the Red Sea, protected them from their enemies and did miracle after miracle. And they were one minute, yeah, we're praising God, next minute, wanting to go back to Egypt. There was this constant complaining and moaning and yet God still loved them. He still took them through. And then when it got to them coming to the point where God wanted to encourage them to go into the promised land and he sent the 12 spies only two came back, Caleb and Joshua, with a positive report, saying, yes, we can go in and take this land. God's promised it to us. God said it's a land flowing with milk and honey. We can go into this promised land. But the rest of the spies gave back bad reports because they put their eyes on the giants instead of the giant. God, the God of all creation, who was telling them he would go before them into this land and give them a place of rest. And because they refused unbelief, they remained in the wilderness all that time. And none of them saw the promised land. They all died there because of unbelief. The only two that did were Caleb and Joshua who believed. And this is a picture of salvation. This is a picture that the writer is saying here and wanting us to understand that Jesus is our rest. Jesus is that promised land. Jesus is our King, our High Priest, our Saviour, and we are his people. And in verse 18, he says, To whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were obedient? There we go, the sin of unbelief. So we see that they were not able to enter because of this unbelief. Friends, what this the writer of Hebrews is trying to say I'm, he's saying, I'm showing you the new covenant. I'm letting you know that Jesus is the fulfilment of all of this. And if you walk past the cross, if you step over the cross and you just keep going and you ignore it and you go back to the temple and you continue under the old covenant of Moses, you continue to offer sacrifices when Jesus has offered a once for all sacrifice for you by his shed blood. Then you're making a mockery of Jesus' sacrifice for you and you're still living in unbelief. But friends, for you and I, there's a better, better news. We have received the gospel. We do know Jesus. We have received that new covenant heart. We've believed him. We've heard him. We've received him. We have now come into that place of rest. Jesus, for you and me, is our Sabbath rest. Enjoy resting in Jesus today. And I'll see you again. Take care. Bye.